Well, thank you, Brian, uh, Governor Sandoval. Uh, you know, we really do appreciate the efforts that, that you and Dale uh, made, but uh, really what you've, you've done is you've given everybody the tools to, to do the necessary work. And I think uh, going forward, the hard work, as, as you've indicated, is, is, is really a lot to be done. And, and um, I, I think this uh, forum is a, is a great place to start. My, my name is Brian J. Jack. I've lived in Southern Nevada for 25 years and have had the opportunity to view our community from a variety of perspectives. I'm a certified public accountant. My wife is a adjunct professor of history here at UNLV. We raised three sons who have graduated from the Clark County School District, and one of them is actually a elementary music school teacher here. And we have two grandchildren uh, who are currently enrolled in Clark County School District. So um, I've got a connection. Um, in, in addition, I'm a member of uh, the Board of Trustees of several nonprofit organizations focused on improving education here, including the Eleanor Kagey Foundation, the Lynn M. Bennett Legacy. So I'm very happy to have been invited to be a participant um, in a small way in this uh, forum uh, and very honored to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Jamie Cassip, the chief education evangelist at Google. As his title implies, his role at Google is more than a mere job. The English word evangelist comes from the Greek word euangelion, which is translated into someone who brings the gospel, brings the message to others. So Mr. Kassab's job is literally to bring the good news about how technology and imagination can be used to educate our children. Mr. Kassip has a nearly religious belief in the power of education to prepare any child, regardless of his or her personal challenges, to succeed in America. Born and raised as a first generation American to a single mom on welfare in Hell's Kitchen, New York, and now as an, an executive of one of the largest technology firms in the world, He's in a unique position to help us understand how digital tools can be used to help educate students from diverse backgrounds and environments. So please help me welcome Mr. Jamie Cassip to stage. Clicker. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Governor, that was an amazing talk, and I, uh, I, I work with Doug Ducey in Arizona, and I'm going to go back and say, if he doesn't act like you, I'm going to move to Nevada. That was, uh, what you're doing in education is amazing. So um, uh, just some, uh, some context here. My name is Jamie Cassip. I'm the, uh, the global evangelist, the chief evangelist for education at Google. Uh, here's some contact information for you. I'm pretty active on Twitter. Uh, pretty active on social media in general. Actually, it's probably the best way my wife gets a hold of me is on Twitter. Um, and she'll text me, and I won't respond. And then she'll tweet something to me and then publicly shame me for not responding to her tweets. Uh, some, some great conversations happening in education around hashtags like EdChat or EdTech. If you really are interested in education, if you're really interested in what's happening with educators in the space, I would encourage you to get on social media, get on Twitter, join those conversations. They happen on a, on a daily basis all over the country, uh, talking about the issues about education and what's going on in education. I also write a blog on education uh, that you'll find on my website. So uh, that's some of the context that we have. Uh, I've been at Google for nine years, uh, which is the company's only 17 years old, so it's a long time to be in, in one place. It's the longest I've ever been anywhere. And the reason I've been there is because of what we're doing in education. We have some great programs going on. If you want to learn more about what's happening at Google in education, I encourage you to visit our website. 
you know, find a whole bunch of things, including programs on uh, whether it's Google Apps for Education or Chromebooks uh, or coding. Uh, this is the coding week, coding education week. I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Uh, so if you're looking for some more information, we have it there. Uh, but it's been said many times this morning so far, the idea of why uh, we're here today. Why, why, why do we care so much about education? Where, where does the passion come from? And I get the chance to travel all over the world and talk to thousands of educators and leaders in education and policymakers and business folks to talk about the issues of education and the same passion exists, that we believe that education is absolutely critical. Um, few uh, are doing things about it, unlike your governor here in, in Nevada. See, I'm very impressed by what you said. The, <laughs> the uh, few are doing it, but we have this kind of common denominator, this belief about what in, what's important in education. And for me, like many here, uh, it's a personal uh, journey. It's a personal issue for me. I, as mentioned, I'm a first-generation American, born and raised in Hell's Kitchen, New York. Uh, not the Hell's Kitchen that you go visit, to, visit now with all the nice restaurants. The old Hell's Kitchen of the 70s and 80s when you got off the plane at JFK they used to give you a pamphlet of places not to go into because you'll die. My neighborhood was on that list um, in, in Hell's Kitchen, New York. So it was not the nicest neighborhood to grow up in. And I wanted out of this community, like many kids. You know, kids don't want to live in this community. They want out of these communities. And, and I saw two ways to get out of this community. One was to you know, play in the NBA. Or two, I don't know why people laugh at that. You've never seen me play basketball. I'm pretty good. <laughs> or two, to get my education. And the odds are against you even in, in, in that frame, right? So college, you can imagine what high school graduation rights were in, in Hell's Kitchen, New York in the 1970s and 80s. Not very high. Uh, I think we had a 50% graduation rate in that community at that time. But I, I put on what I call my reality distortion glasses. Uh, I graduated high school. I went to college. I graduated college. I went to graduate school, got my master's degree, and here I am standing in front of you. And, and if this isn't enough of a, of a proof point or evidence that someone can grow up in, in a community like Hell's Kitchen, New York, and then work at Google and be here and, and have an effect you know, we have 50 million users using Google Apps. I launched Google Apps into the university space. When we signed Arizona State University, I launched Google Apps in a K-12 space. I launched Chromebooks in education. So the impact that you can have is tremendous, and it's, and it's visible and evident to me every day. Uh, but I had a moment this year that I want to share with you that kind of highlighted this idea that you can take a kid from Hell's Kitchen and you can accomplish anything. Uh, the first lady of the United States asked me to come speak to a bunch of students at the White House this past summer. And I, of course, uh, like the governor said, I said, yeah, 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 sure, yeah, I can do that. Um, and so I went and thought that I'd be speaking in some conference room, you know, in the basement with folding chairs, and was ushered into the East Wing, which I'd never been into, the East Wing of the White House. And I started seeing portraits that I recognized from television, like the Kennedy portrait. And I'm saying, is that, like, is that real? And like, yeah, that's, you're in the White House. and and. And, and so, and, and then I looked like, where, where is this happening? And it's like, it's, it's happening in there. And I'm like, in the East Room? And, and I couldn't understand why people weren't profusely sweating like I was. Um, and, and then this moment happened where this happened, where you can take a kid from Hell's Kitchen and he can speak in the East Room of the White House. And I am standing in the green room, which isn't what I thought at the time, like some place where they put makeup on you, but the actual green room of the White House and I'm standing in the doorway there, and, and I'm thinking, and it hits me. I'm standing as, as I'm being introduced into the White House, into the, into the East Room, and I'm standing there, and I'm thinking, and I'm looking down on the ground, and I'm seeing a worn-out floor, the wood floor there, and I, and I realize that every president of the United States has stood there in that spot waiting to walk into the East Room to speak. And, I, and, and like my knees start buckling. And then you walk into the East Room, and it's lit up, but 10 times, 100 times as bright as it is in here, because they have the cameras and the videotapes and all the video cameras and all these things going on. Uh, and I walk in, and I'm trying to hold my ground while I'm walking up to the podium. And I stand up in the podium where you see me there, and I look out, and I see that red rug, or that red carpet, where the president comes out and says, we killed bin Laden, and then walks back. And I'm standing there and looking out at that thing going, oh, this is, that's where that happens. And I'm like, oh, I'm inside the television set, right? And I'm, and I'm holding onto the podium so I don't pass out. But I'm looking down at the microphone, and you can see there, looking at the microphone, and 
This is the most powerful microphone in the world, right? This, this microphone is the freest microphone in the world. The booby, bully pulpit, can, can, you can talk to anyone in the world from this microphone. And still, the hoodlum kid from Hell's Kitchen looks at that microphone, and all I want to do is scream out Baba Booey. So I, <laughs> I didn't, um, but that, that's, the, this is the, that's the, the point of the American dream, is that we can, we can accomplish anything. And that's the power that we have with our students in our classrooms today, the ones that are in those classrooms, uh, sitting in those classrooms today. But we also have to realize that the power that we have for our students go beyond the students that we have in our classrooms. The power, the impact, the effect that you have for students goes on for generations and generations. You are impacting students and kids that you will never meet in your entire life, that will be alive when you are no longer here, right? Because now I have kids. I have my own kids, and my daughter, uh, she's not a big fan of this picture uh, because she assumes that you guys assume that that's her kid, and it's not. It's my kid. Um, so I have three. I have a 23-year-old, a 14-year-old, and a one-and-a-half-year-old. Um, and this is the moment where I realized that I actually don't like kids very much. Um, I can only handle, or I can only handle one at a time, right? Like, I can only, it's, it's, it's been great. I don't, wouldn't recommend it to everyone, but it's worked for me. <laughs> and this is my daughter who is graduating from Arizona State University. And... Um, we never talked about college. It never came up. We've never had a conversation about whether she should go to college at all. She just assumed she was going to college because I went to college, because her mother went to college, because everyone around her went to college. She assumed she was going to graduate school because she's way too competitive, and there's no way in hell that she's going to be able to live her life knowing that I have an advanced degree and she doesn't. And, and she assumed she's going to graduate school because I went to graduate school. She assumes I'm paying for it, but that's a good problem to have. And my 14-year-old, you know, he wanted to skip high school and go straight to game design, right? These are the problems that I have with my kids. And my daughter is about to pack her bags after Christmas and go down to Argentina and spend six months down there uh, working for a nonprofit, filming stories about what's happening in communities in Argentina. Their perspective, their point of view, their impact, uh, uh, or, or their, their point of view is so different than it was for me. And they don't even know that it was their, my fourth grade teacher, my sixth grade teacher, my ninth grade teacher that is the reason why they have the life that they have. That's the real impact that we have for our students. And so when we think about that and we think about how important education really is, we want to make sure that we're preparing students for the future. As the governor mentioned, we are living in a different time. In 1973, 28% of the jobs required some kind of post-secondary education beyond high school. In today, we are pushing close to 50%. In the next 10 years, it's going to be 60%. The, the need for higher skills is not going to stop at any time soon. We are, we are going from an industry-based, industry manufacturing-based economy to a globally connected economy to a network-based economy to a knowledge-based economy. We have to prepare our students for that future. And we have to make sure that we're doing that today because that economy is here right now. Now, what's the role of technology? Well, for the longest time, the world, well, think of it this way. The world has changed in our lifetime. Everyone in this room, the, ro the world has changed in terms of how we get access to information, right? For most of history, the access that you had to information, the access that you had to books, the access that you had to libraries, these were the factors that determined your academic success. The more, the closer you were to books, the more education you had. The closer you were to libraries, the more access you had, the more you can educate yourself. This was true in our lifetime. This, was in, this is inside the Columbus Library on 51st Street and 10th Avenue where I grew up. This is where I had to go get my information for my reports, for my stories, for anything that I was working on. This was the, the Columbus Library. This served my school, PS111, PS, it served PS17, PS51, Holy Cross, Sacred Heart. This was the main branch library in Hell's Kitchen, New York, that everyone in the community had to use. And it closed at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and basketball practice would go to 445. It uh, wasn't open on the weekends. And if you can memorize the 17-digit number that you found on the card catalog to find the book that you're looking for, and you went up on the shelf, what happened? The book wasn't there, right? Because someone else took the book or put it somewhere else and you can't find it anymore. 
And this has shifted in our lifetime. Today, we have 100 million Columbus libraries at our fingertips. We have all the world's information at our fingertips, and we're not taking advantage of that. Our classrooms basically look the same as they did when I was in school. My, I just went through my, uh, my kids' high school opening day this year and went through all the classes, and it was basically the same format. Now, I'm helping them with what we need to change for that formula, and I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end, but what we're doing in our classrooms is basically the same, and yet the world, the, fr the infrastructure, the structure that we use for education has radically changed. How do we take advantage of this? Now, talking about technology and education, this is not the first time we talk about technology and education. We've been talking about technology and education forever. Motion pictures were gonna revolutionize education. Television was gonna revolutionize. And computers, we've been talking about computers since the 60s. I remember I took a computer class in eighth grade because computers were gonna be important in my future. Even though I'd never seen a computer before, and it was like a decade until I saw another one, computers were gonna be important to me. I took a programming class. I learned how to program in basic and I wrote about 5,000 lines of code and I made a bird fly across the screen on a Commodore 64, remember that? <laughs> and, I'm, and I remember that, like nine months on this project, finally that bird flew across the screen, I'm like, that's it? That's, that's what, right? So we've been talking about technology for a long time. Why is it different now? Why is there more emphasis on this? Why am I here talking about this? Well, three things, number one, is that we've been able to collect some amazing research and evidence on what good learning looks like that we've been able to build over the last 25 years of how we can make it engaging, how we can make, how we can make it relevant, how we can personalize it, how we can individualize it, how we can create student-centric learning models. And we haven't been able to implement any of these because it takes an infrastructure to be able to do this and the technology wasn't, at, wasn't to par, if you will, to be able to do this. We haven't been able to do this. Now we can look back at all that research we've been able to collect over the last 25 years about what good learning looks like and see how do we take technology and implement those ideas? How do we take technology and bring those ideas to life? And we're starting to see that across the world, but that's the first, that's the first point, is that we can actually start using technology because it's finally usable enough to actually take advantage of it. So that's one. Number two, is the way in which technology has wrapped itself around the core of our lives, unlike when I took that computer class in eighth grade, I'd never seen a computer. It's wrapped itself around the core of our lives like we have never experienced before in history. For example, how many of you, now it's like 9, 9.30 in the morning or 10.30 in the morning or whatever time it is, how many of you have not used technology today? Look around. How many of you have not used the web today? Usually there's one person like, yeah, my kid ate up the whole data plan this weekend and <laughs> I don't have any access to my phone. Or my other favorite answer, yeah, I don't use the web, I just, I just use my email. Um, <laughs> right, like, so how long did this take us to get to the point where a room of five, 600 people or however many folks, how many number in here that have not used technology before, or have not used it today, and it's like nine o'clock in the morning, and we are already on our, most of us are on our technology, we still have crusties in our eyeballs, and we're like waking up, and we're already on our email, or checking the weather, or doing something with technology. Do you remember that we used to have to call the internet? <laughs> like, place a phone call to the internet <laughs> with our home phones, and the internet was busy. And you were okay. You were like, oh, the internet's busy. I can't talk to the internet right now. I'll, I'll try back later. <laughs> right? Or it would just hang up on you, right? And what was your reward for this, for this experience that you had to put yourself through? It was a bunch of pages that had words to links to other pages that had words to links to other pages that had words. And you were okay. And that was, that was, that was mind-blowing to you. Every once in a while, somebody would post a picture and you'd get all excited. There's a, there's a picture coming. I'm gonna stand here and wait for 20 minutes, but there's a picture coming. <laughs> and today, what's our expectation for technology? Instantaneously, right? I've seen teachers, the most, I'm a huge teacher fan, the, the most patient, most understanding people in the world. I've seen you turn into mobs at conferences <laughs> if the Wi-Fi is too slow. 
I myself, I fly a lot. I've, I put about 150,000 miles on. I'm actually on my way to, to Philadelphia and then DC this week. And I, have, I made a promise at the beginning of this year that I have failed miserably at. And I said I was going to stop using a Wi-Fi on airplanes because I found it too frustrating that the internet was too slow while I am traveling at 40,000 feet in the sky and 535 miles an hour. <laughs> and if these experiences are true for us, what does that mean for a generation of kids that don't know any better? A generation of kids that don't know that the world existed before Google. A generation of kids that don't know that the world existed before smartphones and tablets and all the other devices that you have in front of you. A generation of kids who don't know that the world existed before Wi-Fi. Remember, I, 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 this is a true story. My 14-year-old this a couple weeks ago asked me, what's Cyber Monday? And I said, oh, well, back in the ancient days, um, we used to have to go to work to use technology. And that's why we went shopping on Monday, because that's where our technology was. It was at work. Right? So think about where Cyber Monday comes from. And he's like, I don't understand. Like, why can't I just shop on Sunday or Saturday or Friday? Like, he has no idea why it's Monday. Right? A generation of kids who don't know that the world existed before Wi-Fi. Tell a 10-year-old that there are places, buildings, locations that don't have Wi-Fi. And they're like, what? Take me to these ancient places. I must take pictures with my smartphone and post it on Instagram. They, they, this is a generation of kids who are growing up with technology all around them. Now, I am not saying that they are different than we are. I'm not saying that they are wired different than we are. And I would be cautious or careful of anyone who comes up and says, this generation of kids, they're different than we are. They're wired differently. They, they can multitask. They can do four things at the same time. No, they can't. They do four things poorly at the same time, just like we would do four things poorly. So they're just like we are. But how they think about learning is different than the way we think about learning. And that we have to put on a post-it note and stick on our, on, our, on our computers and remind ourselves of this every day. How they think about learning is different than the way we think about learning. I'll give you some, a quick, two quick examples. Number one, my daughter, who hates to fly, terrified of flying, miserable flyer. I hate flying with her. Everything's going to go bad that's going to go bad with her flying, right? So. Every year we go on our summer vacation, and a couple years ago we went to Hawaii. I try to take my kids and explore the world uh, the, with the, with, uh, because I'd never had that opportunity, right? I thought everything on the other side of the George Washington Bridge was the West Coast. And so I get, I get to get, get my kids the opportunity to, 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 to view the world. So we went to Hawaii. I'd never been. It was the first and only time I've been. And have to fly over water. She's terrified, hates flying over water. So like any good parent, I drugged her up and I bribed her. And I said that when we get to Hawaii, you can get a ukulele. She's a musician. She plays instruments. Uh, she plays five or six different ones, uh, loves to play instruments. And I said, we get to Hawaii, you can get a ukulele. She wanted, that's her, that was her thing, right? That was her carrot, if you will. I won't talk about the sticks. But that was her carrot. And when we got to Hawaii, we're buy, we went to the store and we buy a ukulele, like a real ukulele, like, a, like a, the entry level ukulele, because apparently you can spend $10,000 on a ukulele. I didn't know this. But we got the entry le level ukulele. And we're walking out of the store. Now, this was like two, three years ago. So keep in mind my role. I've been at Google for 10 years. I've been doing this for 10 years. We're walking out of the store and I noticed out of the corner of my eye, instruction books and videos right, little storefront there on how to play the ukulele. And I say to her, hey, because we're, you know, we're investing $100 into this thing. Hey, do you want to buy instruction books and videos on how to play the ukulele so you can learn how to play the ukulele? And, and for the first time, she looked at me with that, you know, that disdain teenage look, that like, oh my god, you're dead and you don't even know it look, right, like that look. <laughs> Why? How is she going to play the ukulele? She's going to watch YouTube videos, but we're blocking it in schools. Right? We're having arguments about whether we should be using YouTube or videos in schools. And my daughter, that's how she's going to learn. She's going to go find someone that's going to teach her how to play the ukulele, and she's going to connect, because that's the first place she thinks about going. This is a picture of my 14-year-old when he was 13. Actually, I got one of those Facebook reminders that said the memory things that tell you, like, this actually, a year, two years ago, today, actually, uh, this picture came in. And, and this is him 
showing me his lines of code, right? Uh, because he taught himself how to code in Java. Because he played a game called Minecraft, and one of his casinos wasn't as making, one of the games in his casino wasn't making enough money, and I, I was totally expecting the FBI to come through my door at one point, <laughs> but one of his casinos wasn't making, it's a, to, it's a play casino in Minecraft. And he, uh, and he didn't know how to modify it, so he taught himself how to code in Java so he can modify it. Now, he's, oh, two years later, he's a pretty good coder in Java. He went online, found a place to code. He didn't wait for an instructor to teach him. He didn't wait to go take a class or a program. They, it's not that they don't want to, it's just that they don't think that way. They think about learning in a different way than we think about learning, and we have to keep that in mind. Let's stop trying to make our kids learn the way we learn, and let's look at the world that they live in and figure out how we can help them learn in the world that they live in. It's a completely different mindset. Thank you for this. <laughs> now, when we talk about the future, and we talk about a world where, where we have some uncertainty, I saw some, I've been seeing some interesting things over the years about how teenage, uh, kindergarten kids today, 60% uh, of them will have jobs that don't exist in the future. So how do we prepare our kids for that world? What can we do in education to make sure that we're building the infrastructure that these kids need for the future? I'm gonna focus on a couple of things. The first one is, again, thinking the way we think we have to stop doing and start thinking about other things. Um, the first thing that I want us to stop doing is I want to stop asking kids what they want to be when they grow up. I cringe every time someone asks my 14-year-old, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? How many in this room will still have that saying that says, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up? Right? Let's stop asking kids what they want to be when they grow up and instead ask them, what problem do you want to solve? What problem are you interested in? What problem spins in your head? What are the knowledge, skills, and abilities that you need to solve that problem? How do you learn those knowledge, skills, and abilities to solve that problem? Where do you get those knowledge, skills, and abilities? What classes can you take online, offline? What reading material is available? What research is there? What blogs can you read? Who should you be following on LinkedIn and Twitter? Who else is solving this problem? And so on and so on and so on. How do we open up the world for get them to think about the problem they solve? Because when we ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up, you're asking them, hey, who do you want to go work for? And there's a good chance that the job doesn't exist. And two, that's kind of boring, right? I mean, how does my kid know that he wants to be a biomedical engineer or that he wants to work with living organisms, sustainable material to create living structures that breathe and move at the same time, jobs that exist today? Instead, when we ask them what problem you want to solve, you're giving them that magic triangle that Daniel Pink talks about in terms of what motivation is. Giving them a purpose, giving them autonomy, and then giving them uh, mastery, that what, what motivates all of us as humans to do things. Right? You're giving them that opportunity. When you ask them what problem you want to solve, you're giving them the opportunity to think about that. And it doesn't have to be the problem that they solve for the rest of their life. It's the process of problem solving that we're teaching them in this framework. Right? It's the idea of how do you tackle issues? How do you tackle problems? Right? It doesn't have to be solving world hunger. It could be making vacuum clean cleaners quieter, which is a problem you think we would have solved by now. Right? <laughs> Every cat and dog in the world would be satisfied, would be happy. There'd be a revolution by, if we could solve that problem. So, sorry, I got on a trend. So it could be any problem that you want to solve. It's the process of problem solving that we want, that we want them to get through. Um, I say this often at conferences. Uh, I, someone quoted me once and put it on the slide and presented it at a conference and it, and it caught fire a couple weeks ago and it was shared more than 150,000 times across the world and, and translated into different languages. Because this is something that resonates with people, this idea that we are all natural problem solvers. That's how we're born, right? Most of us are problem solving when we don't even think about it, right? Even in your daily routines of how you get places, you think about, like, if I brush my teeth this way instead of this way, I can save 8.9 seconds and I can sleep longer. Like, we're always problem solving. How do we get our kids to think about that? Um, by the way, just real quick, this is a, our Google Science Fair winners from a couple years ago, and I would encourage all your students to participate in the Google Science Fair that we have every year. It's an online competition, and I just want to highlight the, the girl in the middle there because she kind of symbolizes the world that we live in and the world that we're moving into. Uh, she's not your typical science student, but there was a problem that she wanted to solve for one of her friends who, by the way, lived in the Philippines. And talk about Generation Z, 
25% of them would have to fly in an airplane to spend time with their best friend. Unlike us, again, when we lived, you know, we, we were stuck with the five kids on our block, right? That's all we had and we had to deal with it. This generation can pick their friends, right? We weren't that lucky. And her friend in the Philippines didn't have electricity. And she was upset that she couldn't read at night or couldn't do her homework. And so she invented a flashlight that's powered by the heat of the human hand. She's 15. The capability and capacity that children have is amazing if you change the questions for them, if you get them to think about uh, solving problems from a different perspective. Don't worry about the, guy, the winner, the guy next to her. He, um, uh, he invented you know, the ability to create plastics from banana peels, but he's 16, he's a slacker. Um, anyway, so what problem you want to solve is the first thing. The second thing, and oh, this is an example here of when, I, when a teacher takes this back in their classroom and asks their students, all of a sudden the students are thinking about it and posting it on the wall, and I get lots of pictures like this that highlight that question and kind of invigorates the classroom to think about problem solving. The second thing we want to make sure that we're focused on is iteration skills, right? Not teaching kids how to fail and teaching kids how to succeed. Those, those words don't exist anymore, right? We want to teach our kids how to fail, great, but the opposite word is succeed. Both have endpoints. We don't live in a world of endpoints anymore. We live in a world of continuous and constant iteration. If you use Google last night and then use it again today, there's a really good chance you use a different version of Google because we update Google about 600 times a year. You're using a different version of Google. If you're using Google Apps in your schools and you're someone who works in the training space or an administrator, you usually throw things at me because we update Google Apps 200 plus times a year. And we get the stop updating Google Apps from, from educators. And sorry, we won't. But we live in that constant iteration. How do we teach our kids how to iterate? Here we are arguing about grades. Grades don't matter. What do grades mean? Right? What, what is an A? Is an A just meeting expectations? Right? Uh, there is no A. There's just constant, constant iteration that we want to make sure our kids are building the skills that they need so they're constantly learning from both successes and failures so that they're constantly building. We want to make sure our kids are focusing on collaboration. And I mean real, real collaboration. We say collaboration in education, but we don't mean it. We don't. Because education, because of where it was, when it was set up, is set up as an individual sport. The problem is that we live in a team-based world. Right? It's my 14-year-old who's responsible for grades. It's my 14-year-old who takes the test. It's my 14-year-old who gets pushed out the door, and we say, good luck. Go work with others. Imagine as teachers, you hand out a test in sixth grade, seventh grade, or eighth grade, and at the end of the test, two kids come up to you holding the test together, and they say, we decided to combine our skill set and work on this together. What would your reaction be? You're cheating. Why are we teaching our kids that collaboration is cheating? Right? Real collaboration, and I'll turn that into my world. I go to Larry and Sergey, the co-founders of Google, or Sundar, the CEO, and say, here's the education plan. I did it all by myself. Did I work with any other teams? No, I didn't. I swear, I did not work with any other teams. <laughs> did I talk to anybody else about this? Nope. Did I get feedback? No, I swear, no one else looked at this. <laughs> How long would I last in my job? Right? All the stories that we heard early on were about collaboration, right? people working together. We want to teach our kids how to really collaborate. And I, I'm talking about real collaboration where their part is part of a greater sum, where they don't feel alone, like that their skill set is being complemented by other skill sets and that they're all working together for that common goal, that common good. Real collaboration is the ability to listen. Right? If you're competing in school, how are you listening? Right? Real good listening skills involve questions. Like when I teach, I, I'm an adjunct professor at ASU, when I teach, I, I rate people in my head by the questions that they ask me because I know that they're listening, right? Real listening skills, we need to develop our skills. Real collaboration is the ability to change your mind, to listen to an opposing point of view and actually change your mind based on that data and that evidence. Real collaboration is the ability to build consensus and also build leadership and be a leader by either building that consensus or be a leader by actually following the consensus, right? Real collaboration skills is what we need to do in, in, in our classrooms. How do we use technology to help us do that, not just in our classrooms, but across the world? 
And we want to make sure that we're building strong digital leaders, not just consumers. Just because our kids are born with technology doesn't, doesn't mean that they know technology very well, that they know how to use technology. We have to teach them how to vet information, how to make sense of information, how to, um, to look for the right kinds of information, how to tell the difference between good information and bad information. Right? Real, real digital skills so that they're creating things and they're posting things and they're creating their digital footprint and that they're safe and they know how to be safe and secure and they know how to keep their privacy, all the things that we want to make sure. If they're not going to learn how to do this in school, where are they going to learn how to do this? Right? So we want to make sure that we're building digital leaders. Now, what we need more than anything in education isn't some magic program or some, some, some model that exists for everyone. Often I talk to education leaders and they say, just show me a school that's doing it right and I will just copy what they're doing. And that doesn't work. It doesn't work in business. It doesn't work in any other industry, right? You, you can say, just tell me what Google is doing and I'll do exactly that. And you might be able to take best practices, you might be able to take some ideas, you might be able to take some other things from that, but it, you have to make it your own. And we, what we need more than anything in education is this shift, right? From getting kids to memorize things to actually making meaningful, uh, taking information and converting it into intelligence and making it meaningful. Um, getting kids to memorize things still is important. Getting kids to memorize facts and figures and those types of things make sense, but in the context of a deeper learning that kids need to solve problems in the economy that we're facing right now. Right? Back in February, I saw something interesting that said 7% of Americans can name you the first four presidents of the United States. And this was a story about how embarrassing that is. But I thought about it, and I'm like, is, is, it, is that bad or is that good? Like, what does that mean that 7% of Americans can name you the first one? Oh, all of a sudden right here in the front, the vibe changed. <laughs> Especially that table over here. Because I can point to one of the guys in the suits here and say, name me the first four presidents. And if, I won't, so don't worry. And, I, and if they don't know, for the rest of the day, you guys are going to make fun of them because they didn't know who the first four presidents are. Even though you didn't know who the first four presidents are, <laughs> You just didn't get called on. Or I can give everyone in this room 30 seconds, and all of you can tell me who the first four presidents are. In this world that we live in, information is a commodity. It has no value. What is valuable is what we do with that information to convert it into intelligence. So we can ask our kids, tell me who the first four presidents are, or we can, say to our, we can ask our kids, what would happen to this country? What would this country look like if John Adams was the first president of the United States? What would this country look like if Jefferson was the first president? What, would, what, were the first, what are the four things that the first four presidents all agreed on, and how did, that, that, how did that add to the value of our country? What are the four things they disagreed on? Who was right? Who was wrong? You get into a deeper meaning of things, and guess what? You still have to know who the first four presidents are. Right? It's getting kids to understand things on a deeper scale. We've taken care of the facts and figures. Um, and again, there are many things that kids need to memorize, so that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we can get into a deeper way of doing it. And we're starting to see this with some students' empowered learning models all over the world. We're seeing the kid take the center stage on what is it that I want to learn? How is it that I want to learn? At what pace do I want to learn? Where are my interest areas? What are my cultural elements? How does my culture, how does my perspective add value or not add value to what it is that I want to learn? And how do I do that? And we're starting to see this in a collaborative way. Now again, real collaboration where you're talking about parts of a sum, not group work. It's not the same thing, right? And so we want to make sure that we're starting to see this and we're starting to see this in places all over the world. We're starting to see a need for experimental learning models and this is really exciting. And, and all the education leaders in this, in this room, I would encourage you to give your teachers the space to experiment, to try different things, to measure, to see what's working, what's not working. Uh, even at the university space, this is, um, I think this is a, a Harvard class where they're taking MOOCs to the next level where you can actually have all the people in a room at the same time and they're spending a lot of money to do this, right? And so we're starting to see different types of learning models uh, focused on outcomes, not just teaching, which is a little different. 
Uh, we need to make sure that we're building competency-based education. And we're starting to see this with maker models and project-based learning and really exciting spaces like that where we're getting kids to actually get their hands into things and do things and actually make things. And, and rating people not necessarily on some test with a letter grade, but on their achievements and what they've been able to accomplish, what they can show with the work that they've been able to do. And we're starting to see this. And kids are demanding this type of work as well. And we want to make sure that we're focusing on our teachers. We have to focus on our teachers. I was encouraged by the governor's remarks about focusing on teachers and what we need to do our teachers, especially getting teachers into our, uh, our low, I don't even like saying low income. I grew up poor in our poor communities and, and making sure that we have the, the best teachers we can in those communities because they need the most help. And that we have to give our teachers the competency that they need, so the knowledge, the skills, and abilities that they need to thrive uh, to teach in this new world and what we're building for this new economy. And we're starting to see this, and I'm, I'm encouraged by the, by the amount of professional development that I see for teachers, focused not just on like, you know, how to handle this or how to fill out these forms, but real professional development so that they, they, they can master their craft, uh, which is a very difficult craft to master. Because at the end of the day, when that door closes, nothing is more important in education than having a great teacher in the classroom. And that's absolutely critical. And that's where it starts, and that's where it ends. Yes. The key thing here is that there is no future classroom. right? And I love this picture. I found this picture on, on the internet, because this was supposed to represent the future classroom. And I don't see anything futuristic except maybe a bigger board. right? And the fact that nobody's touching anything. But, um, that doesn't look very much different than this to me, right? And so what we need in education isn't a, some model or some future classroom. It's a culture change that we're always constantly iterating and improving and, and innovating in what we do in our classrooms, which, by the way, is the economy that we're facing. We have an opportunity to get education to reflect that economy that we're building. So we want to make sure we do that. And I want to leave you with, a, 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 with an example of what that looks like from a Google perspective. This is the original Google.com, right? This is Larry and Sergey putting a couple of machines together. This is what it looked like. So what's innovative about this isn't necessarily search. It was actually com uh, how we distri did distributive computing, uh, which was being done by mainframes at the time. And they wanted to do more of a distributive, learning, a distributive computing model. And this is what they came up with at Stanford. And then this is what Google looks like today. This is one row of the gazillions of rows of data centers that we have. And today, we build our own data centers. We build our own uh, hardware, our own software. We write all the code ourselves. We wire everything. We build everything. Everything in the data center is ours, uniquely ours. And there's two things I want to point out. Number one, this is not what Google looked like on Monday. And then this is what it looked like on Thursday. This took 17 years of communication, collaboration, problem solving, innovation, iteration, critical thinking, all the things that we're talking about. What we need here is patience and hard work. This is not going to be an overnight thing. This takes a long time. But once we get going, there is no end point. Because the second point here is that this is not what a data center will look like 17 years from today. If it does, it's probably because we're not around anymore. There is no data center of the future. There's just constant iteration and innovation to what data centers look like. And that's what we want to make sure we're focused on. Now, here's the good news. We are just getting started. And I don't mean Google. I mean all of us in education. We are at the very beginning of this. Uh, this, is, this is a picture of me and uh, the former superintendent. But we have a new superintendent of uh, Phoenix Union in, in Phoenix. I pitched them an idea a year and a half ago. I wanted to create a new kind of school. Uh, called, and it's called the Phoenix Coding Academy. And we're going to do project-based, inquiry-based learning in the school. And we're going to teach programming as the language that kids learn for the four years that they're there in their regular classrooms. Right? So they're going to take biology and programming and history and programming. And they're going to combine those things. And we're going to create that magic triangle around building the mastery skills and building the uh, autonomy and building the purpose that kids need so that they can thrive in this environment. And so we're going to graduate 100 kids every year, especially in downtown Phoenix, Latino kids who can program and can code in four or five different languages, potentially, including English, Spanish, and, 
and you know Python, right? This is what we're building in Phoenix, and we're doing it in a different way. We're asking different questions. We're hiring, we hired the principal already. The school opens next fall. We hired the principal already. We're hiring the teachers right now, and we're giving them a blank sheet of paper, and we're saying, uh, you're going to teach history with, and instead of project, instead of making volcanoes out of uh, egg cartons, you're actually going to teach kids how to code volcanoes or whatever it is that we're going to we're going to do. And here's a blank sheet of paper. Good luck, right? And when it's not a magnet, it's a magnet school, but it's not a magnet school test-in based. It's not test-in based. It's not a, a charter school. It's a real school. We're going to prove that you can be iterative and innovative inside the school district, and it's a passion based school. We're recruiting kids who are passionate about computer science, passionate about programming, passionate about problem solving, and that, we don't care what your grades are, right? We'll get you up to speed that first year um, as, as you're building the skills that you need to, to, take, to, to, to get into programming, but that's what we're basing on. And the team was, um, was, was wor worried. Did you give me a signal yet? Okay. The kid was worried, the, the, the team was worried that we wouldn't be able to recruit students to the school, and, um, Two days ago, I got an email from someone, and uh, she said that her student's really good at her. Her kid is really good at math, and is doing advanced math. And she love, and she thinks, she assumes that the school is already maxed out uh, for for the coming year. But she wanted to get her kid on the waiting list uh, to make sure that her kid goes to the school. And it's about 45 minutes away from where the school is, and the kid is in second grade. So the reaction has been pretty good. All right. But we are just getting started. We are at the very, very beginning of this, right? This is the most exciting time in education. Uh, in 1995, which wasn't that long ago, 1% of the world was online. 1%. It took 10 years to get to the first billion people. It took five years to get to the second billion and four years to get to the third billion. We're, and we're still only at 40%. So if you have a computer and you have access to the internet, you have a huge global competitive advantage right now compared to the rest of the world. We are at the very, very beginning of this. So I want to leave you this, with this closing thought as you think about all this for the rest of the day and as you go into your schools and into your spaces about education, I want you to think about a five-year-old and all the things that a five-year-old does. And then I want you to think about whatever technology it was when I said how many of you had not used technology today, whether it's your, your iPhone, your iPhone 6 Plus, your iPhone 7, I don't know what numbers you're up to, or, or your, your new iPad, the one that's like this big. I can't wait till people are at the Grand Canyon taking pictures with that thing. <laughs> or, you know, for me, it's, you know, the Nexus 6P, brand new phone. This thing is like two weeks old, right? It's a brand new phone. And I want you to think about that five-year-old and realize that this is the worst technology that that five-year-old will ever see in their life. This is their Commodore 64. They're going to be in, in 20 years, they're going to be 25 years old, and they're going to be in a thrift store. They're going to be hipsters buying stuff at the thrift stores because that's what hipsters do, I think. And they're going to find this in the 50 cent box and they're going to buy it because they're going to remember. You know, you start remembering things when you're five. And they're going to want to take it home to hang it on their shelf like a museum piece, <laughs> the way I have a Blackberry hanging on my shelf like a museum piece. And they're going to remember, they're going to be like, oh, my dad used to have one of these. Oh, my God, guys, because that's how hipsters talk. He's going to say, she's going to say, he used to have to plug this into the wall like every day. <laughs> Those are the kids who are coming into our schools in the fall. Do we have the right infrastructure for them? Do we have the right processes in place? Do we have the right, uh, the, the, right, the right knowledge, skills, and abilities that our teachers need to help those kids take that technology, take what the future that they're facing, take the problems that they're facing, and give them the opportunity to solve the problems that they want to solve? Have a great day. I'm very excited about what you guys are doing in Nevada. Thank you very much.